Because if, if, if uh, no, because if you have a friend and he makes a movie and it's bad, if he shows it to you in uh, in rough cut, unfinished, you can, there are ways to say, gee, I think you could do this, this, this. But if someone shows you a finished movie and it's bad, there's no reason to say, gee, that's bad, <laughs> because you just hurt their feelings, you know. But I think that's true in everything. There's no reason to. If, you, if someone does a painting or a book and it's bad, unless you're a critic or something, there's no reason to say that's bad because you just hurt people's feelings, <coughs> you know, to them. But uh, because everybody makes bad movies, I mean, everybody does. Um, I like the idea of knocking the camera over. <laughs> I have, I, I've always admired directors. Um, men or women directors are all over the world because it's quite something to make a movie, even a bad one. It's quite an accomplishment. And uh, so I've always respected directors. And from, from schlock, I've always had directors in my movies, mostly just for fun. It's not important. I have, yes, in the past. Not on the set, but I do. But uh, yeah, no, I've asked advice from Alfred Hitchcock and George Roy Hill. And, yeah, I've asked people. It's always wrong. But yeah, you know, I like, uh, it's very strange because, okay, when I lecture at film schools or universities, I always start by saying, what is a director? What is a film director? I'm asking, who knows what a film director is? Puppeteer. Who, what else? What's a film director? I start to, a film director is anyone who's directed a film. Okay, so it's it's a funny thing because just because you're a film director does not mean you are good or worthwhile. It just means you're a film director. Like an author, an author. You know what's an author? An author is someone who writes a book. He's an author. It doesn't mean he's a good author. You know, it's just. Uh, I just, because filmmaking is so full of logistical nightmares and equipment, technical problems and cable, you know, movies are made with this shit, you know, this, and uh, it's just so many things can go wrong that it's, it's impressive when anyone makes a movie. The good news for you is the new technology, you know, digital is amazing. I, my last film, Slasher, which hasn't been in Spain, but it's a feature documentary, we shot entirely on these little DV cameras with no lighting. And it looks great. Transferring the film, it looks great. It's amazing. And it, I'd say within 10 years, there will be no film. It will all be digital, and it will look great. I mean, it doesn't look perfect yet, but it will. And uh, it's just so much cheaper and easier. You have that advantage as filmmakers now. You can go out with a little DV camera and actually make a, a pretty good looking film for ten, twenty thousand dollars So it's very impressive. And, and uh, I think that more and more interesting filmmakers will come up this way because it's made it much more democratic, just the economics. I mean, anything. It, yes. it, uh, most film credits, you don't know what they mean yes. unless you were on that film, <laughs> including director. Because I've worked on films where it says directed by, but it was directed by the cameraman or the continuity person or the star or the producer. But it's said directed by someone else. So you never really even written by. I mean, I've made several movies that were written by me, and I didn't get the credit. So it, it depends. Uh, all, traditionally, traditionally, a producer meant the person who handled all the financial aspects of a movie. That's no longer what it means at all. So. Uh, you know, it depends what a producer is now. A producer usually is the person who controls the property, meaning the, the screenplay or the book or whatever it is you're making the movie of. Because he controls the script, he hires or he's involved in getting the money. You don't know what it means anymore. Now you read producer, executive producer, associate producer, line producer. Unless you're on the movie, you don't know what the fuck it means. And so it's... Uh, I don't know, and also when you say Hollywood, there's no such thing as Hollywood anymore. They're now all international conglomerates. And there's, you know, when they talk about the American film business, 
the American film business has pretty much become the international film business. Um, and it's strange. It's, it's, uh, it's a brave new world. It's different. You know, and, they, and the studios don't respect directors in the way they used to. I'm very lucky that I started in the 70s because filmmakers in the 70s were given a lot more freedom and control. Uh, the studios now don't necessarily want to hire me. They look at me and go, well, he has an opinion. <laughs> He'll tell us to go fuck ourselves. You know? um, so they don't want that. They would much rather hire someone who will cooperate or that they feel they can control. Because there's a lot of money in it. And it's, it's a different business. It, what happens is, at a certain level, when you're the director, you are the producer. Meaning that you're the one who's actually hiring everybody and making all the decisions. A producer becomes then just essentially like a production manager. So on movies, uh, I had a guy named George Folsey, who I used on many movies as my producer. But he was really a film editor. And it was just so that I could have someone else take the name, you know, you know, do the phone calls, take the names and stuff, but I made all the decisions. So it produces a very strange word. You never, you never know what it means unless you are on that movie. Because sometimes a producer is just someone who, at one point in history, had a connection with that project. Very often you'll see, you know, producers like six names, and you go, what the hell did they all do? Well, five of them usually did nothing. So traditionally now, a producer is someone who gets the money. <coughs> yes? Ben Stiller as an actor, I think, is funny. Uh, it depends on what movie he's in. You know, it depends what he's doing. But he himself is talented. Um, he didn't come from Saturday Night Live. Uh, but Saturday Night Live is a comedy show that has a, a repertory company. So many comedians who go to Saturday Night Live come from other places. I mean, the original cast, Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, Jeffy Chase, they all came from Second City and the National Lampoon. And, and uh, you know, they, there's a lot of comedy going on in the state. And now I think the best comedies are done on television. South Park, um, Simpsons, and there's sometimes TV series, there's one in America that I'm called Arrested Development that are really funny. Um, some of the best political stuff. There's a TV show in America now called The Daily Show. Do you ever John Stewart, The Daily Show? It's a news program. Every night, that's, that's uh, they call it the most important show on television. But it, it's a, a comedy, a satirical. And it's very funny. Most of the movies, comedy movies now are bad, but, but most movies are bad. So uh, there are still good comedies. Every so often, they'll come through. But the studios are not interested in good comedy. The studios are only interested in the bottom line. So they'll make like a lot of the Adam Sandler movies. He's Adam's talented, but most of his movies are dreadful because they don't care. They're just made to the lowest common denominator. Uh, okay, uh, all of them have had an I mean. I'm, I'm a big fan of silent films, so Buster Keaton and uh, Harold Boyd and Laurel and Hardy and Chaplin and Harry Langdon and, and uh, you know, I'm uh, Max Linder. Yeah, but, but all those, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of comedy, so whether it's uh, Italian or French or Jacques Tati or, you know, Japanese, if it's funny, it's funny. Uh, there are filmmakers, many filmmakers, that I really admire. Uh, Mac, you know, Max said it, uh, Leo McCary, Howard Hawks, uh, comedy filmmakers. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many that I'm not thinking of Preston Sturges or who, whoever it is. But, but I've been influenced by It's impossible not to be influenced by everything you see. You know, so when people say, I have no influences, they're lying. Because they may not know what their influences are, but you're always influenced. In terms of my movies, what I can see is that I've never, I don't know if I've ever made a great film, but I have made very influential films. And people copy them all the time. They still do it, which is, which is strange. The difference between performance now and performance just 30 years ago is the death of uh, theater. In the United States, there was vaudeville. <coughs> 
music hall and burlesque and theater. Every town, just before television, every town had theaters. So you had thousands of actors and jugglers and dancers and performers perfecting their craft. The, the Marx Brothers didn't make a movie until they were in their 40s. They'd already had 30-year careers. W.C. Fields, Abbott Costello, Will Rogers, all these guys, Stan Laurel, they all had long careers on stage. Bob Hope, you know, perfecting their comedy. Now, uh, very rarely do people, when they come on the movies, have any kind of background. When they do have background, it's usually television or something. So you look at someone like Jack Benny or George Burns or the, you know, the really great comedian. They had 50 years of experience, you know, in front of audiences. Now you have kids, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old that no, they have no chop. What, what I call chops. It's a, a word meaning chops that you know. You, Trumpet horn players have chops, meaning they, they know how to play, they know how to blow. And it's just experience. And when you make a movie now, very often you're dealing with actors who have no experience. And that's strange and different. And I have, I have had the unique experience. I'm, I'm sorry, I was born in 1950, so I grew up with movies. And you too, most of you people, you know, you were, you were alive with television and movies. You grew up that way. The people who came before us, invented it. Movies are only 100 years old. They're brand new. So I work with people like George Palsy and uh, so many people who, were, who invented the language. You know, really invented the language. We just reinterpret. So it's, uh, I, I work with George Burns, uh, Bob Hope, uh, Jerry Lewis, Steve Martin, <laughs> you know, Eddie Murphy, I mean, I'm John Belushi. I've worked with many, many, many comedians. And the, the older ones always have more, more chops. They're always sharper. Uh, they're people with great talent, uh, but they depend on their director. Um, if you look at the older actors, someone like Gene Hackman is always good. No matter how bad the movie is, he's always good. But most actors now really depend on their directors and the movies, whether they're good or not. And that's the difference in skill. If you ever watch the old stars of Jimmy Cagney, James Cagney is always good. Edward G. Robinson is always good. Charles Boyer is always good. You know, I mean, it, it, it's not, it's different. It's a different skill. And uh, people say, how do I work with actors? Every actor is different, so I work with every actor differently. Some people you just say louder, softer, you know. Some people you have to really manipulate and trick it be a puppeteer. I don't like doing that, but I do that. I'll do whatever, I'll be me, or I'll be nice, you know, and I'll be like the son they never had, or their lover, I'll be whatever it fucking takes to get the piece of film, and then I can make a performance. But it's much better when you have someone who delivers you the performance, who comes in and you get a performance. And that's unusual. Now, visionary is the word, but influential, <laughs> yes. Um, American Werewolf in London is, a, is not a comedy. It's a horror film. And it bothers me when people call it a comedy. It is fun. And it's meant to be fun. But uh, those two boys show up in a truckload of sheep. You know, and they're dead. <laughs> they, they go to the slaughter plant. It's not subtle. You know, it's tragic. They're dead. Uh, but it's funny because I was trying to treat it realistically. And the supernatural, the basic premise, is ridiculous. Man turns into a wolf in full moon, it's ridiculous. Um, it's like religion. The basic premise of most religions are incredibly stupid. So you, 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 know, you try to make it real. Um, and how do you do that? Well, when I thought about it, most people of a certain economic level and sophistication and education know that werewolves don't exist. So when confronted with a werewolf, they have no defense. If you, if you are, it's very easy. See, that's the thing, as Mark Twain said, it's pretty easy to be stupid. It's always a problem to be smart. But smart people always kind of see different aspects of things. Uh, 
um, stupid people don't have to. So if you're like an ignorant peasant, and you, you know, you, you see werewolves, well, you know what werewolves are. They're out there and they're going to kill you. But smart people know that's not true. So if the werewolf is there, how do you deal with it? And it's funny. I mean, it's basically a funny idea, like vampire. It's a funny idea. You know, and uh, again, I said this yesterday, but to me, one of the great horror films of all time is The Exorcist. Because I do not believe in Satan. And I do not believe as Christ is the Messiah. And I don't buy any of it. I think it's completely absurd. But when I saw that movie, for that time I was in the theater, William Friedkin made me believe <laughs> in the evil of, of Satan and the power of Christ. and totally bought it. As soon as I left the theater, it went away. But, but, but I totally bought it for the movie. And that's the power of film. To convince you of something that isn't true. You know, to make it true. So for, for people who had a, a Catholic or religious background, that movie was even stronger because it was so smart. You know the thing they show in front where all these people are talking about President Bush and then it says, you know, the fantasy film festival and some things you can't explain? That's perfectly ironic. And it's very much like American Werewolf because, in fact, he is president. What's happening is terribly horrific. People are being murdered and killed. I mean, it's like, it's, it, and how do we react to it? With disbelief. How is this happening? So we react, everyone laughs in the theater. Is it funny? No. But we laugh. That's our defense. But no, one of the things that American Werewolf did that was bad was now it's normal to make horror films funny. And very often I think what it does is it, it, it undercuts. They don't understand why Werewolf was funny. Werewolf was funny because it was serious. So but they're being funny to try to be funny. So a lot of these films, the self, what are called the uh, deconstructionist in our self-referential films, like Scream and stuff. I thought the opening of Scream, the first 10 minutes was great. And then the rest of it, I thought, ah, oh, this is stupid. <laughs> you know? I mean, it was a comedy. It just wasn't real. It didn't, there was no realism. And then all the screams after. There's no realism to it at all. It's like the Jason movies. With Friday the 13th, that's not scary. That's stupid, you know? I mean, I, you know, to make a scary movie like Halloween is scary, the first one. Really scary. You know, and uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Really, really terrifying. And Psycho, I still think, is, is, is a great film. And what's interesting is that, you know why those films are so scary? Because there's no supernatural. There's no, in, in Texas Chainsaw, or Psycho, or Halloween, there's no supernatural. Those are people killing people. And people are crazy. And people do kill people. That's why those are so frightening. I don't think it's hard to make a, a person with an axe scary because people with axes kill people all the time. To make a ghost or something, a dragon or, or something that doesn't exist, to make that scary is, uh, is the challenge. I didn't think that was scary. It was not scary. It was just boom, you know, and boom is not scary. I can do that. Anyone can do that. Um, a scary movie is one that, like, uh, like, you know what I think is a brilliant film? Evil Dead. Sam's movie, Evil Dead, because it's really scary and it's really funny. That's really hard, you know. When he, when he went Evil Dead 2, stopped being scary and just became comedy. You know, that was fine. And like Peter Jackson's uh, Brain Dead, or, you know, that's not scary, but it's funny. You know, those are just comedy. But every so often, someone makes a really scary movie. And, uh, I was very disappointed when I saw Blair Witch. I thought, this isn't scary. <laughs> I watched the whole movie, and then at the very end, you go in the house, and there's the handprints, and I thought, ooh, it's scary. The end. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wait a minute. But, I, but there are scary movies. I'm trying to think of the last one. Uh, Toby Hooper's new movie called uh, The Toolbox Murders. Most of it is pretty straightforward stuff. But the last 20 minutes are really intense and interesting and scary. 
most of it's not. But the, the last, the end, it's really like, whoa. You know? um, and that's hard to do. It's not hard. So the other thing people don't understand is horror. Boris Karloff, you know, Boris Karloff and Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, always complain about the word horror. I can horrify you just by showing you something disgusting. It's horrifying, horrific. But, but to create suspense, real suspense is hard. There's a man bites dog. The Dutch, who's the Dutch? Or man bites Belgium. Belgium, film called Man Bites Dog. Really good. That's really suspenseful. You should check that out. A repulsion, Polanski's repulsion. Repulsion. I wrote it Polanski. Yeah, it wasn't as scary as Repulsion, but it wasn't good. I mean, many, many really good scary films. A lot of Japanese films. Uh, Kurt Aiku, really scary. Uh, Obiba. There are a bunch of them. The new, the new Japanese. You know what film I found upsetting? I didn't like it, but I thought it was really good. It was Audition. The Japanese film Audition. I don't like the film because it's, 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 but it's very disturbing, really scary. The Arrow's movie, Devil's Backbone. What's that called? I thought that was great. I really thought that was great. Well, actually, in Animal House, it's 1963, so there were no hymns. <laughs> uh, he's a folk singer. With her. Um, but, uh, I was born in 1950, so that was my generation. And uh, it was great. It was good. Well, sure. I mean, you know, first of all, in the 60s, in the late 60s, when there was the, uh, the you know, free love and stuff, you could have sex with someone and not get a disease. You wouldn't, you know, now you could have sex with someone and die. It's become very Christian. But the, uh, uh, I, some of the hippie stuff was stupid, but I, I thought the 60s were great. I, mean, I, I thought the 60s were remarkable, because all over the world there was very radical and revolutionary things going on. If it's good, yes, you only notice when it's bad. If something's good, you look at it, you totally go, I'm, I'm a good artist, I'm a total sucker. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I get scared, you know, in movies I'm scared, and, and uh, I'm always, I, I'm easy cry. You know, I can watch a movie that'll make me cry, even if I hate it. It'll still make me, you know, I, I'm a good audience. John is making a uh, <laughs> What? I'll tell you, do you know about the Masters of Horror? Do you guys know about that? It's not a club, though, no, but they... There was a documentary on television. Here, I'll do this one sentence at a time. Okay. There was a documentary on television. I think British television called Masters of War, and uh, it was um, Guillermo, Wes Craven, George Romero, Toby Hooper, John Carpenter, uh, uh, a bunch of you know a whole bunch of horror filmmakers and uh, or people who made horror. Films. I always think it's funny that I'm a master of horror. Because it's like, I've only made, you know, two more, well, schlock is sort of a word, and uh, I've made some horrible movies, but in terms of fantasy movies, I've only really made three. Um, but there was this television show, and do you know Nick Garris? Nick Garris uh, is a director, he does a lot of Stephen King things. Nick had a dinner in the Valley, in San Fernando Valley in L.A., he had a big dinner. We invited all the masters of war. So we all, it was like a bunch of guys. We all went to this dinner. And uh, I'm trying to think, David Cronenberg, a whole bunch of guys. And so we went to dinner, and we really had, and we really had fun. It was funny and fun. Because we were doing things like, the masters of horror have coffee. <laughs> the delivery was different. The masters of horror. <laughs> Masters of Horror order dessert. <laughs> anyway, so Mick Garris put together this deal uh, with a DVD company in North America um, called Masters of Horror. And all of us are making these one hour, mine I shoot in February, is one hour 
uh, horrible, <laughs> you know, one hour uh, scary, whatever we want. We have a million and a half dollars to shoot in Vancouver for each of us to make a one hour horror show. And uh, Carpenter's doing one, I'm doing one, and uh, Guillermo's doing one, it's, uh, who else? Uh, everybody, <laughs> I mean, Toby Hooper, everybody. And it's very fun. We're having Japanese and uh, some European directors, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be, some of them will be great, some of them will be terrible, but it'll be really fun. So John is definitely doing one of those. This DVD company puts up the money and they get the North American DVD rights. And then the international, they can sell the international DVD rights. But we, the masters of horror, own everything else. So it might be theatrical. We might put like three or four together and make a movie. Or it might be uh, cable TV or whatever we do, it'll, it'll have more than one. And, and also what's fun is there's no censorship. We can do whatever we want. So I think they're going to be pretty outrageous. Edward Scissor's Dance, you know, the Tony Depp, Tim Burton movie? Do you know that movie lost money? So the people who put up the money lost their money. You know, it wasn't until uh, Tim made, uh, what did he make of such a big hit? Uh, Beetlejuice. You know, then, then he could make, you know, but if he keeps making Planet of the Apes, it's not going to happen again. You know, it's all based on your strength. I could only make Animal House because of Kentucky Fried. And I could only make Blues Brothers because of Animal House. And I wrote An American Werewolf in London in 1969, and I made it in 1980. The script was the same. It was just, I could get the money then. So it's all about finance and money. And the movie business, and I'll say this, is, is, is the movie business is terrible. <laughs> and it's filled with terrible people. But the product is great. So we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do it, I'll do it. We just have to go to the lobby. I keep stealing people's bags. I don't know. Thank you.